welcome to lecture 3g introduction to gpu architectures over the last few lectures we have seen some advanced instruction pipeline processing techniques how to improve throughput by super pipelining super scalar pipelining increasing the issue bandwidth speculative execution and all we are now going to start a new category of architectures which are slightly different from conventional cpu architectures known as gpus graphics processing units let us try to understand what is a gpu graphics processing unit is a specialized electronic circuit designed to rapidly manipulate and alter memory to accelerate the creation of images in a frame buffer intended for output to display so what we try to understand from this context is we need some kind of a specialized hardware unit wherein you have an application where lot of images need to be processed lot of values need to be sent out to the screen for display so how quickly you can process wherein the architectural features of a conventional cpu may not be sufficient to handle this operation typically placed on a video card which contains its own memory and a display interface so we'll come to that this is the conventional diagram of uh, your motherboard where you know that this is the cpu is housed here and then we have a north bridge and south bridge down the line the cores also we we'll learn about this internal architecture so your main memory is kept here and all the high speed graphics devices something like gpu and all are added into this slot so your peripheral devices are connected to the south bridge so north bridge is that which houses the faster devices and south bridge is the place where it is getting connected to the other peripheral devices so typically your video card that is been kept attached to the north port so video card connected to the motherboard through your pci express or agp the accelerated graphics port this is the location in which the gpu is going to be fitted so typically the north bridge enables data transfer between the cpu and the gpu so when you have a gpu here it is through this path that typically the data transfer is happening now we try to understand why we need a gpu with the help of one or two motivational example so think of a case that you are talking about a display which 1920 by 1080 pixels and we require a refreshing rate of 60 frames per second so in every second we need to process 60 frames so this means that we need to process close to 125 million pixels per second imagine that you are going to work with a 3 gigahertz processor with an ipc value of 2 so now you know what do you mean by ipc the average instructions per cycle that you can do is 2 it's reasonably a medium to high lp but this can process 6 billion instructions per second but what we understand is we require 125 million pixels how to be processed now think of a case that processing a pixel means you have to load the value you have to transform it to many graphics operation has to be done imagine the case that you need 48 instructions per pixel so whatever the total number of operations that is required in order to process 125 million pixels per second this may not be sufficient with a 3 gigahertz processor that you have so this is not enough for high intensity games applications and sometimes the refresh rate also going to be higher and sometimes we may use very high resolution display also so when it comes to graphic effects and movies the hd movies that you watch more amount of pixel processing is required where a conventional cpu may not be able to sufficiently support let me now talk about the another example it's called raster graphics so in the raster graphics what we typically do is this is called a raster graphics pixel an image is represented as an array of pixels let's say if this is going to be your general array and then we have rows as well as columns that is been there and then at each point each pixel we have to mention what is the color of the pixel so generally an image is represented as an array of pixels where i will tell 0 0 location and this is going to be the color the color we may use some multiple bits then 0 1 location what is going to be the color so it's represented as an array of pixels and then we use very simple rules to create them so what we do is once a value of the pixel is been there we are going to simply show it on the image so if you try to zoom in the image you are going to lose the 
clarity. Now coming into the vector graphics, that is a picture that has been shown here. As you can clearly say that, there is obviously there is a clarity difference. So when you go for high end viewing, where the user demands more clarity in terms of the viewing effect, then the raster graphics may not work, may not be the best suited option. We may have to go for vector graphics. So what do you do in vector graphics? The programmer create high level objects, something like shades, textures, characters, etc. And the images are created by applying some basic rules specified by the programmer. So programmer writes some kind of a program which will manipulate the shades, textures and characters that define an image. And this system then generate image using a mechanism known as vector graphics. So even if you zoom, the clarity is not that has been lost. So over the years, we have moved from the raster graphic system into the vector graphic system. So in the case of raster graphics, you have the definition of an image that is available and then this is going to be displayed based upon what is the pixel intensity value. Now if I wanted to perform this image going to be moving, the color of the image that has been quickly changing when it comes to modern day applications, scientific applications, graphics application, conventional raster graphics is not competent enough to handle such a kind of a scenario what the user has been demanding. So it is in this context vector graphics comes into where you define the images with the help of rules and transformations. You are going to modify these images which will eventually show what is going to be the pixel value in the subsequent frames or subsequent seconds in the timeline. So we require more computing power and these are all computing devices which require some specialized functionality that are much suited for an image transformation application that we are talking about in this. So what are the kind of processing requirements that you want? The processing requirements for game high intensity graphics is very huge. Even aggressive out of order processors that we have learned are insufficient in this case. So here what we are using is a special category of programs known as shader programs. So in shader programs we have specific language, custom language to work on objects, vertices and pixels that define an image. And then we use transformation to these images, something like rotate the image, skewing the image and all. And then you can apply some effects also on the textures, on the shading and on the illumination model. So what basically we need is we need a mechanism. So this the whole thing is been taken care of by shader program. So what do you have to understand? What are these shader programs? These are programs which have custom languages to define objects, vertices and pixels that are typically the fundamental blocks of any image. Capability to transform these images by using standard transformation algorithms like rotation, skewing and all. And then sometimes rather than transformation, we are going to apply some effects on it to improvise the images. So we need to have some mechanism which work on textures, shading and illumination. So whatever we have seen about shader programs, all what you do is give an input. The shader program will perform the necessary operation by applying it and then you generate the appropriate output pixel. How do you do it? These are typically done with the help of a graphics pipeline which you will learn in the subsequent lectures wherein you have some vertex processor, some rasterizers, fragment processor. So these are all different steps involved in a graphics pipeline which we will learn. So what we have to understand from these shader programs require some graphics pipeline and it is this kind of graphics pipeline that is a need of the hour when it comes to GPUs. So why we are talking about GPUs? We have certain applications where the throughput, the number of pixels that you process, the number of data values that you are process is more important than the latency that is associated and high throughput needed for huge amount of computations required for graphics, extremely parallel different pixels and elements of the image can be operated on independently. Hundreds of cores are required. But these cores need not be the kind of super scalar processing cores that we told, something like branch prediction is being applied, super pipelining is applied. This may be simple operations, but the volume of work that has to be done, this basic simple operation is huge. So you have huge data to be processed. It may not be a high end processing. It may be a sm small transformation, small computation of a new set of pixels. So here, Rather than considering it as sequentially, since all these pixel transformations are independent of each other, can we think of an alternate architecture and that is what we are trying to explore 
by learning graphics processing unit. So typically what we told a GPU houses a graphics pipeline and these are some of the operation that has been done on a graphics pipeline which includes a vertex program, geometry program, clipping and rasterization, fragment program and frame buffer operations. So ultimately right from a set of points that has been represented to pixel, the dots and then ultimately going to display the pixels with appropriate color, this transformation is done by graphics pipeline. So typically your GPU houses a graphics pipeline. And when you are going to work with GPU, there are certain programs that is running on a conventional CPU which are sequential in nature. The program nature is sequential in nature. The other portion is going to run in the GPU. So if you look at the program should have a CPU code as well as a GPU code that is available. So in this case, when a programmer writes an application, we have to use specific compilers which will understand that portion of the code which has a potential parallelism capability and then realign it in such a way that the GPU can understand it. So some portion of the program will run in CPU whenever there is a parallelization, massive parallelization that is possible. It is been transported to the GPU which is the adjacent unit and then get the task done, bring it back. So GPU works together with a CPU. So the main program is going to be running in the CPU as and when parallel, huge parallel tasks are there that is being offloaded into the GPU in order to carry out the task. Once the task is over, this can be fit in. And the CPU can have a control how to populate the data, in what way the data is being offloaded and taken back. This can be worked out between proper handshaking and control mechanism between the CPU and the GPU. In short, programs will have a CPU level code and programs will have a GPU level code also. Now coming to the difference between the CPU and the GPU. We have already learned about lot of features about a CPU. It may have some control units and the arithmetic logic units which is called the heart of that. We have already learned what would be there in this processing unit. Your instruction pipeline would be there. So a sophisticated instruction pipeline which has, it is connected to one or two levels of cache and some kind of a control information. When it comes to GPU, rather than highly sophisticated functional unit, we have many such hundreds of such kind of smaller processing unit, each with its own level of uh, memory and cache and then controlling that has been required. So that's essentially what a GPU does. If you look at the difference between a CPU and GPU, CPU typically it's a central processing unit and GPU is a graphics processing unit. With few number of cores in a CPU, we are now trading off with uh, hundreds to thousands of cores. In CPU, our focus is to reduce the latency of an instruction wherein you use instruction level parallelism mechanism, prediction mechanism, faster pipeline, parallelly fetching and all. Whereas in GPU, our focus is number of data units that are being processed. So high throughput is the focus. Good for serial processing and it's good for parallel processing. So this will work only if there is a parallelism that is there in the code. And this will quickly process tasks even though they are going to interact with each other. There is a kind of data dependency. So we have learned about operand forwarding, so register renaming by help of reorder buffers. Even if instructions are dependent, I can still run. So even if there is a kind of an interrelativity, CPU architecture will take care of it. The hardware instruction pipeline will take care of it. Whereas in the case of GPU, we break the jobs into separate tasks so that we can process simultaneously. This breaking is an important task and this breaking makes sure that you can run things parallelly. And traditional programming are written for CPU sequential execution. Here you require additional software to convert a CPU function into GPU functions for parallel execution. Let me now talk about another important uh, background that is required to appreciate the rest of the working of the GPU. It is called Flint's classification. Now, what is this Flint's classification? Depending upon what are the programs that are going to run and what is the underlying hardware, with respect to instructions and data, you have instructions which are going to operate on this data. This instructions and data, what are the features of it? We have four different classification of parallel computers. Let us take one by one and try to understand. So what you have to hear the main focus is, you have an instruction that is going to be operating on a data. Sometimes one instruction is going to be operating on multiple data. Sometimes you have one instruction and one data. Sometimes you have multiple different instructions operating on a wide range of data. So we will try to take this one by one. 
So, the first category is our conventional computer, we have an instruction and we have a processing unit and we have a data that is been available. So, I am going to talk about an instruction, let us say add R1, R2, R3, in which this add is an instruction that is coming and R2 and R3 is my operands that is been coming from data pool, you process it and keep back. Conventional computers are SISD, single instruction, single data stream. So, you have a data stream available and you have an instruction stream available. Conventional uni processors means for every instruction, the corresponding data has to be fetched from the data stream, operate it and then store it back. Now, we move to another category which is called MISD. You have the same data that you are going to use and then you have multiple instructions. So, you have instruction 1, let us say it can be add, you have another instruction called multiplication, two different instruction. Let us say they both are going to be operating on R2 and R3. So, R2 and R3 is taken only once from the data pool and then you perform adding and the same data is being given for performing the multiplication also. So, what you have to basically do here is you have multiple instructions that is going to come on a single data that is called multiple instruction single data stream and it is typically used for pipelined computers. Each computer is being pipelined one after another and then they operate upon different kind of instruction, but the data is going to be same. This is not that a popular kind of a, an architecture. Now, I, we go for an SIMD architecture which is called single instruction and multiple data stream. I wanted to perform add operation only, but it can be done on R2 and R3, it can be done on R4 and R5. So, different combinations of data, each of the data that I am going to fetch, but my instruction is same. So, single instruction and multiple data stream, it is called SIMD. Typically, your vector processors, your parallel processing, your GPU sometimes belong to this, this, this kind of broader category where the same operation is to be done to multiple different kind of data. And the last category is called perfectly parallel computers where you are talking about multi core computers, multiple instruction, each core can take their own instruction. So, I have an add operation that is going to be running on R1 and R2 which is part of program 1. Now, I have another program P2 where I have to perform multiplication operation on R8 and R9. So, add operation will go and it will perform its own operands, multiplication operation will come, it will go perform operation on its own. So, it is called multiple instruction and multiple data stream. So, depending upon the available hardware, the parallel hardware that you can have, multiple instructions can be pulled in and they will operate upon their own corresponding data. It is as good as like you have two program P1 going to run on architecture X and P2 going to be run on architecture Y. So, you have program 1 its own data, program 2 its own data, both has its own separate data and program 1 is going to run on architecture X and program 2 is running on architecture Y. So, that is called multiple instruction, multiple data stream. So, just to summarize what we have learned in this Flint's classification is based upon the instruction stream and the data stream, we have four category. First one is single instruction, single data stream. The second category is single instruction, multiple data stream that is called SIMD architecture, which we are going to learn further. Third is MISD, multiple instruction, single data stream. And the fourth one is MIMD, multiple instruction, multiple data stream. Now, to understand more about the GPU architectures, let us try to exploit parallelism. I already mentioned that this is possible only when the task that you are going to do has lot of parallelism inside it. Consider the case of a simple for loop where you are going to add the contents of two matrices A and B and storing the result in C and this is going to be running for n iterations. So, what happens typically in a scalar sequential code, you have to load the value of A, you have to load the value of B. So, this will be happening in clock cycle number 1. In the next clock cycle, you load the value of B. Third clock cycle, we are going to add and in the fourth clock cycle, we are going to write the result into the C. So, what we have to understand, it involves two loading operation and adding operation and the fourth one is a storing operation. So, essentially four operations are to be done in each of the iteration. Now, we move to the second iteration where we are loading the values of A and B, adding it them together inside an adder and then storing it back into C. This is a scalar sequential code that you have. 
do we have any parallelism inside this? Let us try to understand this parallelism here. Can I do iteration 1 and iteration 2 parallelly because it is a matrix addition? In no way, one iteration is going to be dependent on other. This is called an exactly parallel kind of a task. So, we are trying to vectorize it. Let us say, how do you do parallelism inside this? We need some compile time reordering of the operation sequence. In the compiler has to understand this is my underlying hardware such that iteration 1 and iteration 2 can be done. We learned a little bit of this when we were talking about instruction level parallelism. Can the load of A of 0 and the load of A of 1, can it be happening in one clock cycle? If you have multiple hardware units which are capable of loading or if multiple values can be loaded from memory, then a of 0 and A of 1 can be loaded and then can we do the other one B of 0 and B of 1 can you load it is not ending with 1 I can have many such parallel loading that happens. If you have multiple adders then A of 0 and B of 0 can be added at the same time A of 1 and B of 1 can be added like that it happens in every one and then you have the capability to store the result of various adders parallelly into this memory. So, what basically noting is trying to understand where is the scope of parallelism, which are the operations that can be done. Now, am I limited to the hardware resource? So, if I have more number of hardware resource, I can load more values from memory. If I have more number of adders, I can add multiple of them together provided there is no dependency between them. And if my processor memory bandwidth support multiple data items that I can store back, then whatever loop that we have seen wherein B and the value of A that are being added into C can be kept it. How can you identify this? It requires lot of help and support from the compiler. Extensive loop dependence analysis is required in order to facilitate this operation. So, what are vector machines? A quick summary. We have already learned about SIMD machines. So, vectors or SIMD machines are good at exploring regular data level parallelism. When it is useful, the same operation is to be performed on many data items. That is why it is called single instruction multiple data stream. How can you improve performance? Because there is no dependency between them. So, can you see this? This is the way you have a single instruction, you have lot of data coming and then you are able to produce the result. Our focus is basically on this SIMD architectures. So, how are you going to get performance improvement? Performance improvement is strictly limited to the vectorizability of the code, whether there exists any operations that can be done parallelly. There is no data dependency between them. So, scalar operations limit vector machine performance. We have already referred in Amdal's law. The performance improvement that you can gain is limited to the fraction of the code that can be enhanced. Many instruction set architectures include vector like or SIMD operation that has been already there. The Intel have the MMX architectures, PowerPC has this Altivec, ARM has the advanced SIMD architecture. So, many modern day microprocessors are supporting these kind of architectures. Let us try to understand GPUs are the SIMD engines that is been underneath. The instruction pipeline operates just like an SIMD pipeline and then we use programming with the help of threads. It is not with the help of SIMD instructions. The only difference with respect to a conventional SIMD versus a GPU is the operation, the parallelism of the operation and the task is carried out by a thread structure. The difference between what is the programming model and what is the execution model difference. So, programming model is focusing on the software whereas your execution model is talking about the hardware. So, we try to understand what is the difference between programming model and execution model. Programming model refers to how the programmer expresses the code. We write a program and uh, what are the syntax of it and in what way programmer looks at this task. Let us say I write a program sequential. I write a program very specific to a data flow architectures. So, sequential means I am just assuming there is a one human architecture like uh, I write an instruction go and fetch the data and then execute and then store it back. Whereas, the execution model refers to how hardware runs the code underneath. So, from a programmer perspective, it is a programming model and from a hardware designer perspective, it is the execution model. 
are we going for out of order execution model are we going for a multi threaded processor we have learned about fine grained multi threaded processor coarse grained hyper threaded processors so these are all how to so when the programmer is not bothered programmer wants this task to be done can i make use of super pipelining can i make use of super scalar can i make use of um, a branch prediction all these are the execution model of it execution model can be very different from the programming model that we have we are going to discuss about it so example the von neumann model can be implemented by an out of order super scalar process the spmd model can be implemented on a single instruction multiple data stream processor like a gpu let us now take one by one the first one is known as the programming model is sequential that is sisd single instruction single data stream consider this particular code that we have already discussed and we seen that across iteration these are the operations that can be done a scalar sequential code that we already discussed in a single instruction single data stream it can be done on a simple pipeline the processor so this is the programming model that i am talking and what are the execution model it can be done on a simple pipeline the processor or it can be done on an out of order execution processor where independent instructions are executed as and when the units are ready and the value are ready different iterations are present in the instructions window and can execute in parallel in multiple functional units so if you have multiple functional units then i can run them parallelly and loop is dynamically unrolled by the hardware we have already seen that in tomasulo's algorithm so i can run the same sequential code in a simple pipeline processor in an out of order processor in a super scalar vlaw processor very long instruction word processor also i can done it so it can fetch and execute multiple instructions per cycle now let's go and talk about uh, the second architecture it's a data parallel architecture simd architecture it's a programming model is simd now look at this in this case whatever is the loop that we have we have have the iteration 1 we have the iteration 2 that is been there now we are talking about can i do all the loading together all the values of a can i put into a vector load instruction similarly all the values of b that i am currently talking about can i put into another vector register it's called a vector load operation and now a0 a1 a2 everything is there in your v1 it's a vector register a register with a huge capacity similarly your values of b b0 b1 b2 b3 they can be kept in a very wide register known as my vector register that's your v2 can i have a big parallel adder where the corresponding elements are added a0 and b0 is added a1 and b1 is added a2 and b2 is added and this can be represented by a single vector add operation that is called v1 plus v2 is to v3 that's what you get now from v3 i can store it back so we how to define a new set of operations which can facilitate this it's called a vector instruction so we we understand that here the iterations are independent compiler generates an simd instruction to execute the same instruction from all iterations across different data so now we can see that the same model the, the data parallel architecture is the way how they wanted to do it parallel but how it is been done they are going to write it as a vector instructions and then you need an underlying hardware in order to support that now let me talk about multi threaded application so in the same thing let's say you have your iteration 1 and iteration 2 like that many iterations can be done so how do you do it can i do it as a single program multiple data that's what is called as uh, spmd single instruction multiple thread can this be handled by one thread can this be handled by another thread so each iteration is independent programmer or the compiler generates a thread here that is the difference to execute each iteration rather than instructions can a thread takes care of it each thread does the same thing but it is on a different data so we have seen it from a single si sd architecture with in a pipelined processor with out of order processor and with a super scalar processor and we have seen it on simd and we have seen it on a multi threaded so different the programming model and how they can have various execution model for the same code that we are talking about whether it should be sequentially done whether it should be done in a vector mode whether it should be done in a multi threaded mode the programmer can define his choice in order to get the task done 
and under, based on the underlying hardware capability, the execution model can vary from one to another. So, GPU is basically an SIMT machine. That is what you have to understand. It is a single instruction, multiple threads. It is not multiple data stream, it is multiple threads. So, single instruction, multiple threads is an execution model used in parallel computing, where single instruction, multiple data is combined with the concept of multi-threading. In the last lecture, we already learned what multi-threading is. So, here you have multiple data is available. You have a single instruction like an add what we talked about, the single instruction to be operated on multiple data with the help of a multi-threading concept. Each thread execute the same code like A of i plus B of i, that is the same code, but operates on different piece of data. Each thread has its own context. Each thread can be separately started, executed independently. A set of threads executing the same instructions are dynamically grouped into something called warp. It is also known as wavefront by the hardware. So, what is warp? A set of threads. What is the peculiarity of them? They are executing the same instruction and are dynamically grouped together. They are known as a warp that you see. Just an illustration of uh, the SIMT. So, we have iteration 1 and iteration 2 that we, we typically see here. Let us try to see what is warp. This is your warp 0. Let us say the program counter value is at x. So, it is the same kind of an operation, but they are operating on different data, warp 0 for program counter value x. Now, the program counter value increments. So, I am essentially going to take care of the next load that becomes part of warp 0 at p c equal to x plus 1. Now, this become part of warp 0 at p c equal to x plus 2 and this become part of warp 0 at p c equal to x plus 3. So, one by one you may have to carry out and then do the activity. So, warp is a set of threads that execute the same instruction at the same PC value. Okay. The programmer or compiler generates a thread to execute each of these iteration. So, that is the kind of a support that we need from compiler in order to get the task done. And each thread does the same thing like first thread does load, second thread does load, third thread does add. So, the same thing that is being done. We have discussed about it. Now, when you talk about multi-threaded warps, consider the case that you have a warp with 32 threads and let us say I have a program wherein 32 k iterations are to be done, wherein I am looking for one iteration per thread. So, I require total of 1 k warps that is being required. Warps can be interleaved on the same pipeline, then that what is known as fine-grained multi-threading. Let us try to understand how fine-grained multi-threading is done. So, how many threads I have? I have 32 threads. So, this is 1, 2, 3 like that, 32 threads are there, but then I require 32 k iterations. So, 1 k warps are basically required. This is your iteration 1. So, the iteration 1 will be carried out in here, iteration 2 is carried out here, iteration 3 is carried out like that, up to iteration 32 it goes. Now, see what happens? You are talking about iteration 33 will come back into the same unit. So, iteration 33, 34, 35, 36 like that. Similarly, if you look into this iteration 20, some number that you do, they will be all multiplied. So, integer multiples of 32 will take care of load, whatever that number that you have and then add is basically warp 20 at p c x plus 2. This is being done for 1, this is being done for 2 like that, it keeps on going for all of them. So, a GPU execute in this particular fashion in a single instruction multiple thread model. Now, we will try to understand what is this warp level fine grained multi threading. We already discussed that warp is a set of threads that execute the same instruction on different data elements. All threads run the same code. We already discussed about it. So, let us try to understand this is your SIMD pipeline that you have. You have different kind of thread warp that is available and what is there each one? Each one has its own thread. So, let us say you have many threads that is been available and all the threads that are running together, we call it as warp. Similarly, we have something similar to this for warp 1 up to warp 7. Now, consider a 32 thread warp wherein I am performing an operation A of thread id plus B of thread id is given to C of thread id. I am slowly bringing in the concept of threads here. Imagine you have only one pipeline unit. So, C is doing C equal to A plus B. So, C 1 is getting ready. C 2 is getting ready, A's and B's 
a3 and b3 a4 and b4 a5 and b5 are waiting for its turn so as each cycle progresses they will advance and one by one c1 c2 c3 c4 one by one we are going to get the values this is the case where you have only one pipeline the functional unit now what you see here on the right side is we have four pipeline the functional units so c0 is processed by one c1 is processed by the next one c2 processed by that c3 in the meantime c4 c5 c6 and c7 is nearing completion so we have the functional unit wherein the c4 and c8 are being partially processed in functional unit number 1 let's say if i call it as 1 2 3 and 4 as mentioned we have four pipelined functional units what do you mean by pipelined it will take multiple cycles to complete an operation so c0 already completed whereas c4 is near completion c8 is just started and some partial processing is done now what do you see that once c0 is here c1 is produced by the second one so we have four parallel tracks now we look at the sequence 12 is scheduled for functional unit 1 whereas the pair 13 is scheduled for functional unit 2 14 is scheduled for functional unit 3 and 15 is scheduled for functional unit 4 like that 16 20 24 they all are waiting in this queue whereas 17 21 and 25 are waiting in this queue in this way my entire 32 thread warp can be ordered by fine grained multi threading so depending upon the number of functional units that you have you can schedule where this thread has to run so if i have only one functional unit then everything will be there if i have more functional unit then the cyclic way that we have seen just now is going to work so sometimes the number of threads that you have may be more whereas the number of available functional unit may be less so an interleaving mechanism is that is being used in order to facilitate this operation so i just wanted to give what do you mean by functional unit this is the functional unit in this diagram so we have four parallel functional units and each of these functional units have their own set of registers to handle the data that is been coming so this functional unit carry data coming from thread 0 4 8 1 5 9 2 6 10 like that the interleaved mechanism is there and this is what is known as a lane what you see here this is known as a lane whereas we have four functional units parallel and one lane will take care of few threads and all of them are connected to the memory system from which they get the appropriate data so now let us take a case wherein we have 32 threads per warp we have eight lines and then look at the case what we are going to use we have to perform a load operation since you have to perform a load operation and already i have 32 threads that are available this is the way how it's once the load operation is been over then the result is been put into the multiply unit and once multiplication is over the result is been pulled into the add unit so i hope you are able to see the difference once the load is over the multiply unit will take once the multiplication is over the adder unit will take care of that then what happens for the warp 3 again this is the way how things are being pumped into so since you have 32 threads that is been available you can see that it is 8 into 4 32 threads are there and if you look into 24 operations per cycle is being issued we can see that there are total of eight operations that are being done by the load unit similar eight operations are done by the multiply unit at the same time and so if you look at uh, this particular window then you can see eight load operations eight multiply operations and eight add operations are there so 24 operations per cycle i am going to issue they are parallelly done as and when the multiply is over it is ready for the adding so you can see that's how the pipeline arrangement that is been done so i am going to issue your warp in this and in this timeline i may be able to see that so with the eight lines uh, so we can see that what are the eight lines that i am talking about eight lines are there and it's a pipeline unit so you have to perform a load operation on some data so essentially loading a value multiply with something and then uh, adding this will produce your new data so from x i load x perform a multiplication then i perform an add what you get is y so from think of a case these are pixels so from a pixel value x we have to transform into another pixel value y it's not about a single pixel 
we have millions of pixels that are to be done. So when you have a setup like this, loading a pixel value, performing some transformation, in this case the transformation is multiply as well as add and producing y. How quickly you have so many of this x and this has to be transformed to the corresponding y. An architecture like this will facilitate the entire operation that we are talking. So this is in short, in natural what we have seen, same instruction in different threads, use thread id to index and access different data elements. Let us see these are the data element that I am going to perform an add on it. So here we have talking about 4 warps and each warp has 4 thread. So warp 0, 1, 2 and 3 and you can see that this is the typical representation we use for representing the threads. 4 threads are there. So thread 1 will take care of the value 0, the blue 0 and the green 0. The thread 1 will take care of the corresponding values in the next one thread 2 will take care of that. Similarly, thread 3 is also going to take care of that. So, all 0, 1 and 2 can be mapped in this way. So, one way is the cyclic arrangement, the other way is the adjacent arrangement, linear arrangement. So, this all will come into this place. Similarly, this all will come into the other place. So, there are different kind of order in which it can be done. One is the interleaved fashion and this is going to be the adjacent fashion that we have learned. So, coming to the quick summary before we end today's lecture. We started with the concept of in what way we need specialized hardwares. We talked about the kind of raster graphics and vector graphics and what are the requirements for modern day gaming applications, high definition movies and what is the rate at which you are changing the pixel values. And then we talked about the Flint's classification, the four types of parallel computers that we have and then we slowly try to introduce the concept of GPU with the programming model and the execution model. And in what way the execution model and the programming model are related, considering the SIMD architecture, the conventional single instruction multiple data stream, clubbed with the concept of multi-threading, we got SIMT technique. And then we learned about the internals of, of the variation of a CPU versus GPU and how the thread concept is involved, how a huge data can be broken down into smaller components that is being required. In the subsequent lectures, we will go little deeper into the GPU architectures so that you get a better idea and concept of GPUs and how GPU and CPU work together in order to solve certain high end problems which requires faster processing and at the same time of higher throughput. With this we conclude this lecture, thank you.